So now there's probably sound over on Instagram. Hopefully, hopefully nobody left before. They might have already left, but that's okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to pull up some questions that we took from this week, and I'm going to pull up uh, any questions people drop in here. Uh, but there were some great, a really great question that came in from someone on YouTube this week. So we're going to lead off with that. So uh, you can leave questions anywhere basically during the week, and I'll try. I try to get them and try to get them out um, into the world via our Friday Q and A's. So I'm just loading up the question here. May 15th Q&A. Here it is. It was a great question. It was actually two questions. So we'll start with these and feel free to drop them in. Drop them in on Facebook. If you're watching on Facebook, drop them in um, on Instagram. Uh, hey, A.U. Aliasi 2020. Thanks for being here. Sorry, I can't read your screen name, apparently. Um, just pulling up some of our questions here. And making sure that everything is working. The live stream is working. It is working. That's fantastic. Love that. Love when technology is working correctly. Hey, Eric A. And okay, so here we go. Here's the question. This is from Dr. B. Dr. B, he wrote, uh, Nick, love your playing and thanks for all the videos. Here's two questions. One, how do you go about mental mapping the slide position since the overtone series changes the higher you go? I'm relating to the idea to the mental visual mapping of a guitar neck with the relative shapes of thirds, fourths, fifths. Have you found any shortcuts or trends to group together or do you just have to do the tedious task of going through each individually? If so, any pointers on expediting the process? Intervals specifically seem quite difficult for me on the trombone when it's easy on other instruments. Okay. Yes, that is a good question and a little bit of a difficult one to answer. There's a great uh, trombonist in L.A. who's come up with a thing called the Trombone Visualizer. Um, but I don't really think about it that way, I guess. I don't really visualize the positions in that way um, in terms of needing a mental map of it. Um, but, yeah, the, 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 if you memorize the partial series then um, you pretty, it's pretty much the same everywhere. So if you get that first partial is, you know, root, fifth, fourth, and then we get third, minor third, it just keeps going down. Uh, it keeps getting smaller, you know, one to the next. And then it's a fourth after that. And that gets you most of the way. So then if you memorize each thing, like first position is B flat major, Second position is A major, A flat major, G major, G flat, F major in sixth, E major in seventh, and then that's half the keys. And then the other the other half of the keys, you have to kind of work it out. But um, man, I'm trying to think of a way to visualize it. Kevin Hicks, who did this trombone visualizer, you know, he has a pretty extensive video series and a pretty extensive um, like a, a map, I guess, of of it. But um, I've never really thought about it in that way in terms of trying to map it out. I know some people really do learn visually that way, so I can appreciate that they want to do that. But um, but yeah, I just I guess I don't think think about it quite that way, so I don't really have any tips or tricks other than you just memorize where the notes are. That's what I did, and that's what I try to get my students to do. Memorize what position is what notes, slowly but surely. And then when you see the note or hear the note, you go to the position. You ultimately, I think, want to connect your ear to your slide and your ear to, um, yeah, to the slide. So you want to just hear a note and know where it is. See, I'm, I'm trying my best. Or, right? So, you know, trying to be able to sing a note and then play it. That's a big thing that Wycliffe Gordon talks about is like singing it and then playing it. So I've tried to keep it um, as a priority for myself as well. Um, it sometimes is hard to keep that priority uh, as high as I want it to be. But um, yeah, check out the trombone visualizer. Uh, Kevin Hicks is the name of the guy that came up with it if you, really, if you need that. Um, but yeah, I don't really have any shortcuts or trends. I think it's really most important to just memorize where the notes are and where the positions are. Um, I don't think there's any real shortcut around it. I don't think uh, you can, there's no shortcuts in music, unfortunately. So I, I would say that you should just, just memorize it, unfortunately. Even though, so once you put in the time, 
you've put in the time and you don't have to think about it again. You know, you don't have to go back to it. So uh, if you're watching live, thanks for being here. Feel free to drop in some questions. It's Friday, May 15th. Uh, we got one more question here from Dr. B. Dr. B is a great commenter on, on YouTube. So if you haven't uh, been on YouTube and seen what we're up to over on YouTube, last night we did a great watch party and uh, lots of new videos coming out every week. Um, so this next question is about practicing. It's another good question. He says, if you, if you, say, if you have, say, two hours of practice time, per day, would you recommend spending a large section of the session going deep into one or two chords or scales or trying to go more broad and work more but go deeper into each? Which do you see as being more productive? Is there some other way that might be more beneficial? So I think there's a lot of different ways to organize your practice, but to have it organized in the first place is the first thing to do. So um, I've always talked to my students about having a practice journal and then we and I preach that having a practice journal it can be a piece of paper or it can be an official journal. You know, I have my own that I sell on my website, the practice journal, but it doesn't, you don't need that. There's a practice journal free sample page you can download on my website, you, but you don't need that. You just need a piece of blank paper and you just start writing down what you do. And then you start taking notes as to how effective your practice sessions are while you're tracking them. And so when you, when you, look back after say a week or two weeks, you can see was it more beneficial to go deep or to go wide, for example. Um, you could say, look, on Tuesday I worked on one thing but I really learned it, but on Wednesday I learned five things really fast and then on Thursday I reviewed those two things. So I think coming up with your own way, your own practice schedule and your own system is really, really important uh, for making the most out of a practice session or making the most out of uh, a week's worth of practice sessions, even because of one hour or two a day is a good amount of time to be able to put into the horn and put into the music. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that's like a, not a lot of time. That's a good amount of time. And you should see what works best for you because what works best for your brain is not going to be the same what work, works best for my brain. That's for sure. And so it's really important to just be able to dig into what works for you and not worry about what works for everyone else, at least in my experience. Hey, Doug Stone, thanks for being here. Um, I think that um, I like to go deep rather than wide. Hey, Luke, thanks for being here. Um, I like to go deep and have certain goals, uh, certain exercises or certain things that we want to go deep on rather than just going in and trying, how many t songs can I play today? That's not really effective. I find there's, there's a difference between playing and practicing. So playing is just like turning on a Jamie Abersold and just playing, which is an important part of practicing. However, it's not really getting you any better at anything. It's just, uh, you're just playing, you know, which is, which is good. It's a part of a practice session, but it is not a practice session in and of itself, at least from my experience, you know, you might have other experience, um, with your practicing, but um, that's the thing I preach. Get the practice journal, start tracking what you're doing and seeing after upon reflection, after a week, after two weeks, after four weeks, and look at what you've been working on and how it's come, uh, how it's come along. So how much did you get done? How much were you able to improve it in that amount of time, whether it's a week, two weeks, four weeks, uh, and assess, do I need to go deeper on less things or do I need to go, um, wider and get more stuff done. For me, I discovered while I was at Juilliard, um, David on Facebook, I see your question. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, while I was at Juilliard, we talked about this and we talked about what uh, different ways to practice. And I, based on my journal, figured out that the best way for me to practice was to give three sessions and to focus on different things in each session. So uh, we focused on trombone fundamentals in the first session. I focused on then um, like maybe repertoire, like tunes, etudes, transcriptions in the second, and then like improvisational stuff in the third. And if I could get a bonus fourth session, then I would practice like muscle memory stuff. So getting shapes under my slide, uh, maybe playing arpeggios, maybe playing scales, till they get in my muscle memory because it takes you know hundreds of times of playing these things to get them in your muscle memory so i would make specific practice sessions just for that um, maybe while i was doing something else or where i was a little more distracted or where i didn't have a lot of focus and i knew i couldn't really focus for whatever reason i'd be like i'm going to focus in on doing this muscle memory practice rather than thinking all that i needed to um, 
be so focused all the time, basically. You know, you got to be aware of what's happening with you and your body and your mind and not not judge it too much. Just kind of go with the flow get you, and figure out how it works best for you. So for me, 90 minutes to two hours, three chunks. That's what I figured out was the best for me based on using this practice journal. So that would get me anywhere from three and a half or three hours to six hours of practicing a day while I was in grad school. And that was super effective for me and got me a good a good length of the way through. And so I try to keep my practice organized in that way now. So um, yeah, go onto my website. You can just search for practice journal sample page and you can find that if you need a guide. Otherwise, just take a piece of paper and start writing down what you're doing. I like paper, I like analog. Uh, I've used the computer too. I just always forget to go look at it when I use my phone or I use the computer. But when I have a piece of paper sitting on my music stand, it's a good reminder for me. So that's why I use it. Not that I don't like technology. I do like technology. I just don't want to um, forget. So that's what it's a good reminder for me to have that piece of paper sitting right here on my music stand. Um, so feel free to drop some questions in Instagram. Um, I forgot. Usually I post a day in advance to get questions, but I was so busy with the watch party yesterday. I totally forgot to um, post a call for questions. So um, I just have these ones that we've pre-saved, but feel free to drop some in. There's one coming up here from Facebook uh, from David Kosi. Kosi, sorry. He says, hello, Nick, what trombone do you use? Oh, it just so happens I have it right here. Now I'm in my little practice area set up here. So this is my trombone. Uh, it looks like a normal trombone. It's a King 3B plus. And so a 3B plus is a 3B, but a little bit larger in terms of the bore size. So it's 525 bore instead of 508 bore, which is the regular 3B and the 500 is the 2B. Um, so that's the trombone that I've been using since at, like the end of 2014, basically. So the first record of mine that I recorded on it with was like two months after I got it or a month after I got it uh, was The Chase, that record that came out in 2015 so I, I, rec I recorded it at the end of 2014 so um, so yeah that's that's the trombone 3b plus so I'm really excited about um, a couple things happening this summer please drop in some more questions uh, but in the meantime while we're waiting for a couple additional questions from those of you that are hanging out which I appreciate you all being here uh, for our weekly Q&A. If you didn't know, we do this every Friday, every Friday at um, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I jump on and kind of answer anyone's questions about jazz, about trombone, about improvising, about whatever. And there's always a question about what trombone you play or what mouthpiece you play. And so uh, I'm glad we got that out of the way. But I'm really excited because this summer, June 15th through 19th, I am doing a jazz trombone boot camp. And that's uh, really really gonna be fun and we're gonna have some really amazing guest artists that will be announced soon uh, but we're have a kind of end of an era here end of a pre-sale early bird special on those so if you're a person that's been thinking about the jazz trombone boot camp you can find out more about it if you go to uh, jazz trombone uh, nickfinzermusic.com slash boot camp you can find that uh, i'll throw it up on the screen on facebook if you're watching on facebook slash boot camp i'm really excited about that that's going to be june 15th through 19th we're going to be hanging out talking about jazz talking about trombone talking about improvising having master classes where the students can play uh what's up alan from argentina thanks for being here um and i'm just super pumped about it. it's going to be a lot of fun and uh and yeah, so I, I'm just excited about that. So I don't want to give away too much. You can go over to nickfriendsofmusic.com slash bootcamp if you want to learn about that. I don't want to make this into an info infomercial too much. Okay, so Gil Garza, good question. Um, he says, what's the format for the camp? So the camp is going to be uh, in a bunch of sessions, and it's going to be... Um, like in the morning, we'll do some kind of technique and group warm up stuff. And then after that, we'll have kind of special topics each day. It might be theory, it might be uh, learning tunes or transcription or different things. We're going to send out a survey to the at all the people that register. We can only take a maximum of 15 people to guarantee that everyone gets to play at a master class. So the master classes, which are going to be in the afternoon, and we have four great guest artists and then myself, so one each day. And um, to make sure everybody gets to play, we're limiting the amount of people that can be there. And then um, 
we'll have our lunch and listen sessions where we're just hanging out listening to records and then we're going to have um like virtual practice rooms and we're going to have me and some of our TAs come in and like give you tips on what you're practicing. Uh, we're going to work on a piece as a group and we're going to record uh, like a, you know, multi-screen video that we can have by, for the end of the week. Um, so we're going to do all those different things and it's going to be a, so a variety and it's going to be a little bit determined by the participants. So like I said, we're going to send out a survey to see who, you know, who you want to play for in the master class and hopefully we'll be able to. It's on a first come first serve basis. So whoever signs up first will get the first dibs on the master classes and they're some of the best jazz trombone players in, in, on the planet. So you're going to want to be there uh, if you have any interest in jazz trombone. So um and then uh, what it was, so the little hangout sessions where we're practicing and master classes and we'll have a couple concerts. I know I'm getting excited just talking about it. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. So back to some questions. Uh, Eric says, do you think it's key to move into a big city when you're starting your music career after college? How do you get started and find new opportunities? Thank you. So what I did was go to grad school in the place where I wanted to live and work, which was New York City. And so that's why I wanted to combine moving there with going to grad school to create a community. But if that's not an option for you, then I think, yes, you need to move to a city where being a musician is a possible career, a full-time musician, if that's your goal. And maybe that's not your goal, and that doesn't have to be your goal. But but if your goal is to play full-time, you've got to move somewhere where it's even a possibility. New York, L.A., you know, somewhere with a big scene, Chicago, where you can just play. But I think everyone does more than just play anyway. So uh, you have to go, you have to go to the sessions, go to people's gigs, introduce yourself, just be cool, I always say when we're talking about this at school. Uh, just be a normal person and just appreciate people's music and their musicianship and don't be like, hey, I'm so-and-so, I just moved here, I need gigs, please give me gigs, please give me gigs. Nobody likes that person. So uh, just I encourage you to not be that person and to think about how you'd want someone to come up to you and just introduce yourself and say hi and just be a part of the scene, be around. And when you do get the call, you have to be great, you know, practice, make sure you're practicing and everything is cool so that you make a great first impression because you can't uh, get that back. You know, you can't get that first impression back. So Eric, when you move to where are you trying to go, Eric? Uh, and I think, I mean, you don't have to move to a big city, but if you, but you probably should if you want to play. Um, I think if you want to be a, a jazz musician, uh, an improvising jazz musician, you need to go to a big city and be a part of a scene, at least for a while, to experience it. There's nothing like the scene in New York in terms of learning how to play straight ahead jazz. Yeah, Eric, you should uh, move to New York. I mean, Boston is a big city, too. You know, you got to go to Wally's. You got to go... Uh, to the sessions, you got to hang out and be around, you know. So, yeah, finish over there at Berkeley and then go to New York. That's what you should do. If you want to be an improvising musician, and you don't have to stay there forever, but I think there's just something in the in the spirit of the place. That, you know, it, it helps you to figure out if you really want to do it. It helps you figure out what it takes. It helps you figure out, you know, what you got to do. And so I think it's important to have that experience, that firsthand experience with a scene and trying to get into the scene. And uh, even better if you can go to grad school or something because you have a community built in. So I always recommend people to try to go to grad school somewhere where they want to be. And that's uh, not a requirement. And you can make it, make it in any city. And I think things are different right now, uh, not the same as when I graduated. I graduated in 2000, from Eastman in 2009, took a year off and then uh, moved in 2010 to New York. So I think uh, you have to, you have to, you know, make best, make the best decision you can with the information you have. So, you know, right now there's not a lot of gigs, so it could be a good time to move somewhere and go to grad school um, just to get, you know, get that community happening and start to develop your, your peer group because that's who I play with. <clears throat> oh, I see Luke said, uh, uh, he says Chicago. Luke's from Chicago. Great trombone player. Uh, okay, yeah, he has an example here of the least favorite things that people say. Pe uh, people, hey, I just moved to town. You should hire me for your big band. So yeah, don't be that guy. That's what I can recommend. Don't be that guy. Nobody wants to be uh, 
accosted, I suppose, like that. So, you know, just show up, be cool. Eventually they'll hear about you if you're killing, you know, they'll hear about you and they will want to hire you. Oh, look, oh I heard about so-and-so, they just moved to town. Uh, I need to I need to know about them. I need to have them come play in my big band, et cetera, et cetera. So um, just move to a place, be on the scene and hang. Uh, Alan says, play some real music. Yeah, sure, are you telling me to play? This is a Q&A session, if that's the case. Um, all right, David Cosi says, hugs from Argentina, we wait for your return to Trombonanza. Yeah, I can't wait to get back to Trombonanza too. Um, I was supposed to maybe come this year. Uh, I was supposed to go there and to Australia, and I think none, none of those things are working out this year, so maybe next year. Um, maybe next year. I think all of us are looking forward to the future when we can all return to playing some gigs and playing for people. It's always a pleasure. So, hey, Chris Spohr, good to see you, man. Hope all is well. Uh, just going back here, see, I probably missed some things in the chat while I was talking. So feel free to drop in some questions if you're here live. Um, let's see. Yeah, June 15th through 19th, Jazz Trombone Boot Camp. If you want to have something fun to do uh, in June online, I know everybody's finishing school and probably sick of being on Zoom and all of that, but we will uh, do our best to keep you entertained and learn some stuff during that camp. All right, so it looks like that's it for questions for today. Um, I'm happy to answer any other ones if people want to drop anything in for now. I saw a hello from one of our friends that's on quite often from Count Jay Cuevas from the Philippines. Thanks for being on. Thanks for coming to the chat. Appreciate you. Um, but yeah, we had Dr. Dr. S uh, gave us our good question from, from YouTube today. So feel free to leave questions throughout the week. I do look through, um, I do look through the YouTube. I look through Facebook try and find questions and collect them to have uh, for our sessions. And I think that, that uh, is, is a good way. So throughout the week, as you look at different YouTube videos or Facebook videos and Instagram videos, and you find things that you want to ask questions about, just send them in because I do save them uh, for these Q&As. Oh, I see there's a few coming in now. All right, Adam Uliassi, Uliassi, any tips for working on the high register? Funny you should say that. There's a video coming next week uh, on this exact top topic. Um, I know it's a highly requested topic. So uh, yeah, in short, uh, to play in the upper register, you need to play in the upper register, and you need to play music in the upper register. One of the, everything that people do is like, I'm going to play this high note exercise. I'm going to play these high notes out of context. I'm going to, and I'm going to just try to play high. And it, they don't put it in the context of when they would actually use it, which is in music. And so I recommend playing jazz ballads in the upper register, and I recommend playing anything you'd play in the mid register and play it up up there. Take row shoes, play them in the upper register of the horn. Take um, bebop heads, play them up an octave, uh, all of that stuff. And yeah, it's going to sound bad. <laughs> it's going to sound hard and it's going to sound bad, but it's going to make you more and more um, flexible, more and more strong in the upper register. So um, play stuff in the upper register if you want to develop your upper register. And watch out for the video. It could be next, I think I scheduled for Wednesday, next Wednesday, May 20th on YouTube. And everywhere else so uh, that it'll be a high range video that I was working on this week so I know that it's coming out so it was a very well timed question um, I saw another question from Eric let's go back uh, he says what about getting your compositions and arrangements and circulation within the scene uh, I don't think anyone wants to play your tunes probably no, no offense uh, everyone wants to play their own tunes. That's why I say that. I don't mean to say that your tunes are bad because I have no idea what they sound like. And I'm sure they're great. But most people are looking to play their music. Uh, so you probably want to have your own band and get people in your band that they are interested in playing your music. You know, some people host like sessions and bring have people come over and hang out and play, play your music. Uh, if it's a large ensemble, obviously it's a little more tricky. Uh, but people have reading sessions at the Union in New York all the time. Um, that's definitely a place where you can go to rehearse pretty cheap. Um, but if you, you have to take control of your music and you have to take in control of your own career in that regard because there's so many musicians and so, many, so much classic stuff in the jazz repertoire, so much classic stuff that people want to play that it's really hard to um, 
say like, oh, my new stuff and this is better than, um, and people are gonna play my tunes and my arrangements. Probably not, probably they're gonna play their own because everyone's playing their own. And so I would focus on developing your own thing, you know, not worrying about trying to get other people to play your stuff. That'll come with time, I think. If you have a really great arrangement, over time people will want to play it, you know. So <clears throat> go to Smalls, go hang out, play your tunes and um, that will come over time. The biggest thing, the hardest thing is you gotta be, um, you gotta be patient. <laughs> Something I don't always have is uh, having that patience uh, for the long run, for the long game, and for knowing that it's gonna take longer than you want it to. Um, and that's just a fact, you know, it's gonna take a while. They told, people said when I moved to New York, it's gonna take seven to 10 years to break into the scene and they were right. I thought I could do it faster and maybe it happened in five or six years, but basically seven or eight years in was when the opportunities that I wanted to have happen when I moved to town started happening. So it took that amount of time, seven, eight years. Uh, so be patient, Eric, and just get out there, bring your tunes, play gigs, You know, do as much as you can, have uh, hangs, bring people to play your music and just keep on improving all the time. That's all you can do. I saw some other things here. Okay, Luke has something else to say. He says, get your hands on lead trombone parts as well for high register and work on Frank Rosalino solos. Uh, yeah, sure. You could do that too. Uh, that's not really what I think about working on. But uh, if you want to get good at playing lead trombone, you need to play lead trombone. That's what I think. Like we're... Um, Whatever you want to be doing and get good, getting good at, you have to do that thing. Like, there's no magical exercise. You just you have to play the way that you want to play. So if you know, like Frank Rosalino, for example, is a hero of yours, and you want to play like him, you got to play along with him and transcribe his solos. If you want to play like Dave Steinmeier, you need to listen to those recordings and you need to play like him and get that in your head. Play the charts that he played, play the features that he played, you know, and just do the thing until you can do it. You have, but the first thing is to hear it, know you want to do it, and then try to practice getting to it, you know. Um, I think, uh, but yeah, you. so that, I think that's along the same lines, but just saying the same thing in a different way. Uh, you got to get your hands on the stuff you want to be working on and then work on it and do it. There's no exercise. There's no magical sauce. You can't just like mix up three eggs and some seasonings and like play high notes. <laughs> you know, it's a long process. Uh, yeah, tones are like a picture, T definitely. It's always um, up to the person watching to interpret, you know. Uh, here's a question from Facebook from Michael Ambrosino, who is a great um, member of the jazz media. He has a great radio show. Well, I guess that's online, too. Um, check it out. Jazz Dialectics, it's called. 33 and a third. I forget. Maybe Michael can throw in the name of his... Uh, uh, show while we're, while we're watching this so I can plug it again. Uh, but he says, what are some of the more lyrical trombonists that inspire your soloing? Um, well, I mean, I think JJ's pretty lyrical. I think uh, Irby Green is pretty lyrical. I think Wycliffe is super lyrical in his own way. I think um, Steve Davis is super lyrical in the way, especially he plays ballads and melodies um, in terms of trombonists, for sure. Um, who else? I mean, Marshall Jilks has a great way of playing melodies, especially in the upper register, if we're talking about the upper register. Um, and uh, let's see, who else? Ryan Keberly has a great way of doing it. Um, you know, I think about, this is what I think about when I think about that, in terms of playing lyrically. I think about someone like Sonny Rollins. Why do I think about Sonny Rollins? Because he can play a melody in such a way that you know it's him. <laughs> like, you're like, oh, that's Sonny Rollins. And it's not just from his sound, but it's just the approach. And he's, it's just, I aspire to be like that, to be a person that can play a melody, lyrical or technical, and it sounds like me, or it sounds like them, you know? Um, it's like It's just like you would recognize my speaking voice. I want someone to be able to recognize my playing voice, too. Like, and then not just the tone, but tone is a big part of it and the sound is a big part of it. But, you know, like what is the rest of it? The rest of it is the way you phrase and exactly your your influences and who you're listening to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Irby Green, I mean, Dick Nash is a great L.A. example. Um, 
man, I like classical music too and listening to people like Joe Alessi and I was big into Christian Lindbergh for a while growing up. And But there's so many, I can't just start listening. Listing off people, there's great bass trombonists. There's amazing, when I went to Argentina for the first time and went to Trombonanza, I was just amazed at how many amazing trombone players there are that I had never met before I went there. And I just think that there's so many. And so I'm influenced basically by whoever I hear, I would say. Um, there's some great you know, other guys in New York that are doing it, like like Rob Edwards and Joe McDonough and James Burton, and he plays great melodies. I don't know. There's too many people to list them off. Uh, oh, Michael Ambrosino, I'm going to put your, your thing here on Facebook. It's called currents 33 org. I was close. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, oh, great. There's a lot more questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to do this one before it disappears from, from Facebook, or I'm sorry, from Instagram quick. Is he, Alan says, three months passed without playing the trombone. What exercises do you recommend to start again? I recommend playing long tones, number one, flexibility exercises, number two, and articulation. That's the same I recommend to anyone. It doesn't matter. Uh, you got to get your sound together. got to get your articulation together. So you get the sound together by long tones and flexibilities, which are long tones with motion, and then working on articulation via scales, via arbins, whatever, because you want to focus on the fundamentals because they will translate to all music. So don't just work on a song or something. Work on the fundamentals. That's the best thing that you can do is get your fundamentals back up to par as soon as possible. So lots of long tones, lots of long tones. Okay, next question, Luke Melowitz. John Allred, oh yeah, John Allred is another very lyrical player. I don't know why he didn't uh, jump to mind. He has a great record with Wycliffe, Head to Head. That's, that's one. First time I heard him. All right, question from Luis. How is your sound concept evolving as you gain experience? Uh, it it's getting darker and darker and like trying to be darker and bigger is the, is the short answer to his question, my sound concept as it evolves. Uh, I don't think I'll ever get to an extreme Slide Hampton level of playing a straight bass trombone. Maybe not yet, but... Um, it's definitely something I've been thinking about. Um, and it evolves over time. I've been thinking about maybe even going to a bigger horn. Uh, maybe not, though. I don't want to get too much in the, too, the quote unquote big horn sound. I like something in the middle a little bit. I, but I want it to be resonant and full, uh, but not too heavy, uh, not too transparent. I want it to have some directionality, but also be big, be big if it needs to be big. I used to, when I was a kid, I heard Wycliffe Gordon play with the. RPO, which is the Rochester Orchestra, Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, where I grew up. And he played over the whole group, not loud, but with such resonance and fullness and 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 sparkle, what I like to say about his sound, that uh, it carried over the whole thing. I mean, granted, it's in a theater with good acoustics, but still to play over a whole orchestra super sweetly, like that is what I aspire to. And that comes from resonance, not necessarily loudness. I mean, loudness is a part of it. Volume is obviously a part, but that resonance is what I'm shooting for. So hopefully that answers your question, Luis, but it's definitely getting darker and bigger as time goes on. Um, okay, so Andre has a question. This is a good question, so I'm going to read it off to Instagram. Uh, how do you work on so many projects at once? You teach at UNT, in charge of a label, in charge of a nonprofit. Still find time to practice. You probably have more projects too that I don't know of. Uh, you know, any other project, any other uh, projects would just be like my recording projects or personal projects or working on books and stuff. All of that's been coming out in the last over the last couple of months, last couple of years. Johnny plays trumpet. You're from Rochester too. Nice. Um, how do I balance it all? I don't know that I am the person to talk to about balance. I kind of go hardcore into things when I jump into them. Um, you, I mean, you can ask people from my undergrad times. I would go into a practice room and just lock myself in the room all day uh, and focus on shedding. And uh, at that time, I had less projects. But now um, I try to segment my time to focus on myself and segment my time to work on school when I'm at school and work, work on... Um, outside in music when I'm working on outside in music and that's helpful to have a team of people you know I've slowly built up to have people that will help with those projects and help with um, keeping them on the rails you know and knowing when too much is too much you know um, I just I'm trying to build stuff for the long term and so I just figure hey if I can 
build it a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. In 20 years, it's going to build into something that's worth mentioning or worth knowing about. Uh, I'm not too worried about my time at this particular moment. I figure this is my time to be investing in the future in terms of building stuff. So I just kind of throw myself all into every project, every situation, and try to go as big as I can and then see what happens. Steel O Soul, thanks for being here. You're very kind. Hello. Thanks for making a nice comment, making yourself seen in the chat here. Um, but yeah, Andre, I don't know. You have to balance everything you're on your own. You can't uh, worry about what anyone else is thinking. You know, sometimes that means you're less social. It means you do less stuff, but you're focused on the end goal, which is uh, whatever that is. You know, I have projects that I want to get done and I'm going to get them done. I'm not going to go out with my friends until it gets done. You know, and that's just my personality, I guess. But it doesn't mean that you have to be that way to also be successful. So that's why I say I don't know if I'm the right person to ask about balance because I'm pretty much on or off. You know, I'm not necessarily a person that can balance very well, but that's why I've been, you know, booking tours and putting records out and stuff because I'm always trying to think about long term. You know, when I made my first record, I didn't say I'm going to make a record. I said, all right, well, if I was going to start a business, I would need to have startup costs and those startup costs would be 50, 100, 200 thousand dollars to start to sign a lease to have a brick and mortar business, you know, like you, you could, you obviously don't have to, but you could have all these expenses. And I said, Okay, well, I need to establish myself on the national scene of jazz and what trombonists, whatever. So that means I need to be in these places, which means I need to be in the places where trombonists are like at ITF and ATW and all these other conferences. And then I need to be putting music out. It needs to be on the radio and it needs to be in the magazines. And so just knowing like, okay, those are the goals work backwards from there. And knowing that's going to take a while to make it happen. And then just uh, slowly and but steadily build, 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 build. Um, you just have to schedule, man. Schedule your life out. That's what I do. I have a planner and I use Google Calendar. All right, question from Kyle. What What is your favorite or one of your favorite recordings featuring the trombone? Hmm. I mean, there's so many trombone records that feature the trombone. Uh, maybe are you thinking of something? I'm going to send you to two things that you might not have heard before. That's what I'll say, Kyle. Two things that you might not have heard. One is a great recording uh, called, the record's called Cabin in the Sky, and it features... Curtis Fuller, and it's an orchestra slash brass ensemble with uh, Curtis playing the lead. So that's super cool. And then there's another record called JJ with Voices. Uh, these might be hard to find. I don't know if they're streaming still, but they used to be. Uh, JJ with Voices obviously features JJ Johnson with a choir. And you might think, what? But it's actually really cool. Uh, those are two that I bet that you haven't heard. Maybe you have heard them, but two that I think are a little more obscure that feature the trombone that are super awesome uh, that I like and I've been into recently. I've uh, been talking about them with some other people uh, about potential future projects. So we'll see if those go anywhere. But uh, those are two. Cabin in the Sky, Curtis Fuller, J.J. Johnson and Voices, J.J. All right, question from Luis here. Your writing is really good. Thank you. Appreciate that. How did you get serious about it and who was your most important teacher there? Um, that's a really good question. How did I get serious about it? I suppose I got serious about it in college at, at Eastman. Um, I had to take our arranging class, obviously, but I started playing in a band by one of the composers slash professors slash big band leaders at Eastman named Dave Ravello. Dave Ravello uh, was... Uh, uh, he ran the second jazz ensemble at, at Eastman, and he was um, really influential because he also had a band, he had the Dave Ravello Ensemble, and we would play every Thursday night, and we played his music, and it was coming out of the Bob Brookmeyer, Maria Schneider, Gil Evans kind of um, trajectory of jazz, and so I kind of got serious about it then. I had always been writing tunes before that, um, but then kind of through that lens, and I started writing tunes for my band at the time. I had a fusion band, and then we stopped that, and I started my what became the sextet that I have now, um, and I started writing music for that, and I've just studied basically through classes at Eastman. There's a great thing called Inside the Score by Ray Wright 
Um, but really from studying standards and studying how um, melodies are made, by doing reharmonizations of melodies, by trying to break stuff apart and put it back together, basically. Um, and just from doing it, there's so many crappy tunes that will never see the light of day that I've written, um, and I try to write as a practice, meaning it's not like I just write when I'm inspired. I write regularly. You know, I write all the time. I try Not all the time, but I try to write in a, in a premeditated way so that I'm not waiting for inspiration to strike. I'm showing up writing when I can and uh, getting back to it. So hopefully that answers your question, Luis. Um, Chuck mostly in New York says, play your trombone. Uh, I'm not gonna play my trombone, this is a Q&A session. Uh, if you wanna see me play trombone, go find it on YouTube. There's about a bajillion videos and it's gonna sound way better than if I played it for you right at this moment. Hi, Peter, he just jo joined on Instagram. Um, so I think, that's it. That's the end of our questions for today. So thanks for being here. Thanks for writing. Thanks for being a participant in our Q&A session. If you have anything else, feel free to send me a DM, drop it on Facebook, drop it on uh, YouTube. Lots of new videos. Like I said, some educational videos coming next week. High range. Uh, what else is scheduled? Oh, really big video for um, my online teaching setup. If you've been curious, if you're doing that yourself and trying to get better uh, at it or just get some other tips we're gonna excuse me talk about that on monday and on thursdays we do our trading sessions uh next week is going to be wayne shorter so if you want to hang out at 1 p.m eastern on thursday and then 1 p.m eastern on friday we have our uh, q a and next friday is my birthday so let's make it the biggest one yet all right may 22nd so we'll do that uh, but i'll be here and It'll be a lot of fun. So thanks for hanging out today. Thanks for dropping in your questions. Thanks for uh, wanting to be here. It, makes, it means a lot to me. So uh, I hope you can find something fun uh, to do this weekend. I know everyone is uh, still in lockdown or semi-lockdown. So I, I hope you can practice something or watch some music videos. So anyway, I will check back in with you next week. Thanks for being here. See you later.